Uh, everything okay? You have an assignment due at 11.59.59 on Friday, right? And I'll get you another one, of course, right after that um, so that you can have uh, even some more fun. Um, and uh, we'll start doing things more with uh, general surface types and things like this, modeling with general surface types and all as we go, th as we go through this. Um, and as you'll find is that this course, ten, the, the real physics of this course was done in the last lecture when we started discussing how light bounces off surfaces and everything and, and basically how we, it's too complex and we have to just about hack everything in order to make it look kind of nice. That's the physics in this course. From now on what, what we're going to do is, and there's a little bit more of what you might call mathematics, I won't, but uh, you might call mathematics, and then we're going to start into the real problems of this of this field are effectively data structures and structuring data how are how are data uh, how is the data structures work etc and many of the algorithms are based on data structures here and so uh, some people look at at me doing graphics and visualization and say I'm really an advanced data structures guy um, if you want to look at it in a very simplistic way that you know we do we deal with uh, data structures over and over again and in my group uh, we deal with very large data generally data that cannot fit in the memory of your machine. And uh, the general problems are how do you structure that data so that you can read it in at the right time and do things interactively. Uh, it's done in the games world all the time. Um, today I'm going to take kind of a sidelight and do something called quater quaternions. And uh, quaternions, I, I first saw them when I was a graduate student in mathematics. Um, and they're, they're a curiosity in mathematics, and I'll show you why. Um, but uh, they, we then ran across them uh, again when we started trying to do rotations. And they're a very, very clever, interesting way to do rotations. Um, and so that's what I'll discuss here. And I'll kind of show you these quaternions. They have a long, long history. Um, and it's one of those things that somebody invented for a completely different purpose um, many, many years ago, over 100 years ago. Uh, maybe 150 years ago, and what happens is all of a sudden they pop up and uh, um, are starting to be used again. Uh, so the Sierpinski curve was one of these that uh, it was more or less a curiosity, and now we use it all the time to structure our data on disk, believe it or not. Okay, we use these space filling curves to structure data on disk, and that wasn't the purpose of these things at all. But it's one of those things that uh, that we do. So anyway, here you go. I'm going to give you this lecture on quaternions, and then, of course, this is going to appear in the next assignment uh, for you to do uh, everything I do today. There is a nice set of notes out there on quaternions um, on the website. There are C++ classes on quaternions and unit quaternions, which are going to be the the uh, you know, the thing that we use. Uh, those things are also out there on the website. You're free to use them uh, wherever you want. You can also download Quaternion programs pretty easy. You know, a Quaternion file type colon uh, CPP, you can usually get a ton of hits on the website uh, these days. So um, this kind of it's kind of this mystery, but uh, I'll show you how it works, okay? Now many of you maybe have noticed that uh, rotations are kind of interesting things. Uh -huh. um, here's X, Y, Z, and is anybody counting the number of times I break chalk in this class? Um, <laughs> pardon? That's five. That's five? Oh, okay. Um, the, uh, um, let's take this point up here, one, zero, zero. Okay. And rotate. Let's rotate it. Um, well, I'll do shorthand. Let's rotate it, uh, say, uh, 90 degrees about the x-axis and then rotate it, rotate that uh, 90 degrees about the y-axis. Okay? Let's do this to this point. Okay? And um, I'm not going to write the matrices down, but you can probably see if you rotate it first 90 degrees around the x-axis, it drops down to here. Okay? It drops down to there. And then if you rotate it 90 degrees around the y-axis, it's going to go over here, right? And it's going to end up at being the point, uh, let me try this again, that's zero, 010. Zero. It's going to end up being the point 100 zero, zero when you get done, right? If you rotate it first around the X and then around the Y. 
But suppose you did it the other way around. Suppose you did, you rotated this 90 degrees around the Y, and then you rotated it 90 degrees around the X axis, okay? If you rotate it first 90 degree around, the, see what's going to happen, okay? If you rotate it first 90 degree around the Y, it's going to stay right where it is, right? And then if you rotate it around the X, it's going to end up going down here, right? And so maybe some of you have figured out already that rotations are kind of weird and wonderful things, that if you apply them in different orders, you get different things out, okay? Which is why in these camera transforms, you want to make sure to do your rotations in the correct order, right? If you're looking over here for your points, right, and you don't do them in the correct order, your points all end up over here, right? You're not going to see anything on your screen. And it's a very common thing that people apply these things in the wrong, in, in different order. So rotations don't commute, right? All right, commutation property of things is that A times B is equal to B times A, right? That doesn't happen with rotations. You get different things out, okay? And uh, um, this is something that, that, that pops up all the time and actually causes us a lot of problems. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before. If you listen to the, uh, the uh, radio from the original uh, Mercury astronauts and all, they talk about, well, we're getting close to gimbal lock. And this is one thing that they... Uh, we're doing things with rotations, and effectively, rotations, if you pile too much of them on one thing, you can get them, they'll flip over 180 degrees, right, all of a sudden. That's the one thing you don't want your spacecraft to do, is all of a sudden you're driving along, and all of a sudden you're upside down, okay, or backwards, or whatever, okay. So, um, um, this is one of the properties of rotations. It's a little irritating. It would be nice if they didn't do this, but they do, okay. So, here we go. I'm going to do now quaternions. And I'm going to get back to that, this non-commutation thing in about 20 minutes, okay? I'll get back to it. Um, quaternions were, I think, invented by a guy named Heisenberg. Um, and what, what he was doing was looking for something that extends complex numbers. And if you remember, complex numbers look like this, A times BI, where uh, we like to say uh, I squared is equal to minus 1, right? That if you multiply it, if you multiply two of these things together, like this, you get AC minus BD, and you get... Uh, um, a, D plus B, C times I, I think. And the reason you get this minus B, D is because B times D, you get an I squared, right? And it pops out. And, you know, you can multiply these things, you can add them, you can do everything. everything everybody knows about complex numbers. There's classes over in math department you can do for complex numbers and all. But what, what Heisenberg was trying to do was extend complex numbers for some reason. I haven't looked back at the problem he was trying to solve, but what he wanted to do was he needed another one of these. Okay? Go ahead. I squared, thank you, thank you. I squared is negative one. Thank you. Okay? He needed another one of these. And, um, And where j squared is equal to also to minus 1, for example, okay? And um, he, he wanted to um, make these, this kind of number system work out where you had a second i, okay? And unfortunately, you can't do it because if you just think of it for a minute, you get a plus b i plus c j times a plus... Uh, uh, um, a prime plus B prime I plus C prime J. And when you start multiplying these things, well, you get B times B times times I squared, right? That's okay. And you get C and C prime J squared. That's okay because J squared is a minus one. But you see you have to, you get B, I, and C prime J multiplied together. So you have to know what I times J is, okay? And no matter how he tried, he couldn't make 
I times J. He couldn't figure out what, how to deal with this I times J. That was kind of a new thing, right? And the solution is to this, what the, the elegant solution that he did here, is he said, okay, if I can't define I, I and J, I'm going to add another one on, okay? Where K squared is also equal to minus 1. All right? And he said, then I can make it work because I, I can say that I times J is equal to K. Okay? I knew things. I times J is equal to K. And J times K is equal to I. And K times I is equal to J. And I think uh, you can go the other way. J times I is equal to minus K. Things like this. Okay? It, it, these things go by just put I and J and K in a circle. I times J equals K, J times K equals I. Right, as long as you go around this thing, it's OK. But then J times I is minus K. Right, if you go around counterclockwise, K times J is minus I. And you can define all these things now so that they work. And all of a sudden, you get this number system that's now um, it's a lot more complex than just complex numbers. But it comes out as a really nice number system, OK? And you can add them up. One of these plus another one, you just add up the, the uh, components in front, right? The A's and the B's and the C's, you just add them up, just like you would do with, with complex numbers. You can multiply them together, and you get this god awful, you know, 16 things where you have to then reconnect the sums and everything else. But you can do it, it works. Knowing, it, just by knowing these simple rules, it works. Okay? And you can do all kinds of things with this. And, and he invented these things called quaternions. Okay? And they went up and he used them for a bit, and then they kind of became this curiosity. And I'll show you why they are, they are a curiosity here as we go along. Okay? But, you know, it's quaternions. You can look it up on Wikipedia. They have all kinds of theorems and proofs about it and everything else. You know, these curiosities kind of get, get attacked by the, by the abstract mathematicians. Right until until uh, you know you can't prove anything more about these things, but there's a what happens is if you look at these if you skew the way you look at them slightly, there's a different way to look at them and that is to write them in this form right and I'm going to write them as a and v right okay where a is a right and v here is this vector. B, C, D. Okay, V is the vector B, C, D. Okay? And if you look at them in this way, they, you can make a little bit more sense of this. Okay? And it, it kind of works out. So let me show you here. Okay? So here's a quaternion. I'm going to call the quaternions Q, A, and V. Let's do A1 and V1. That's Q1, here's Q2, is A2 and V2. Now remember, V is a vector, okay? And, and I'm hoping that you're going to see what's coming here. Go ahead. Thank you. No, A is just a constant, okay? A is just a constant. And, and what I want, I mean, what I'd like you to do is say, aha, uh -huh. right? We're gonna, if we do rotate, we're going to rotate around an axis and we're going to rotate. An angle, a certain angle around an axis, right? There's a vector, right, which is going to define our axis, and here's an angle, okay? And maybe, uh, you know, this is going to work. It doesn't quite work out that way, but close, okay? But let me show you how it is. You can do Q1 plus Q2 here, and that's just A1 plus A2. Just add them up, right? So we can add, add these things, we can subtract them. Right? They're fine. Just like we do, you know, here you're doing it with vectors. Okay, and you're still getting the same thing as you get over there. We can multiply these guys together. And this is where it gets fun. Okay? Um, if we multiply, there shouldn't be an arrow over that one either. Okay? If we multiply them together, we get A1 times A2 minus V1 dotted with V2. That's dot product, okay? Dot products are scalars out, so this is still a scalar number. Now over here we get a vector, 
And well, you're going to multiply A1 times V2 plus A2 times V1 plus V1 cross V2, it turns out. Okay, when you multiply these together, you get this mess. Okay? Now, um, just to, to say something, you got to remember, if this vector is zero, right, these vectors are zero, you get back just to the real numbers, right, A1 and A2. The vectors are all zero, right, that ends up being zero, that ends up being zero, you're just multiplying the numbers together, okay, or adding the numbers together. If, if these vectors are all B, zero, zero, if C and D are always zero, right, if C and D are always zero, you end up with the complex numbers in here, exactly with the complex numbers. Okay, so, so this is an extension of, of real numbers and complex numbers, okay? It's an extension. Um, and, uh, um, you know, you can do lots of things with this. You can, let's see, what do I want to do next? Um, um, if I multiply, let me go over here for a second. If I multiply A1 and V1, together with uh, um, ah. uh, let's multiply a and v together with a and a minus v like this um, I get, I'm going to get what? I'm going to get a squared minus v dot v and I'm going to get a this times this, which is a minus a v plus a v, okay, M plus v cross v. Can everybody see this when I multiply it out? Okay, can everybody see this okay? Um, let's see, this is equal to a squared minus, uh, let me write this, the length of v squared. That's what v dot v usually is, is the length of v. And what's over here? Uh, that's zero, right? These two go away. Minus a v and plus a v. And what's v cross v? I got zero, right? So this is zero. All right? So this is zero. So moral of the story is, for some reason I'm not, I, my numbers aren't right here. Uh, uh, I. One of these V's is a negative, so I get a plus there, right? And I'll get a plus there. Now my numbers are right. And if I then say, okay, suppose I have A and V, and I multiply it by A um, Um, all over, let me, let me say, a, a over a squared plus b squared and v divided by a squared plus the norm of v squared. If I do this, I'm going to get, I think it's not too hard to convince you, I'm going to get 1, 0, right? And so what you have here is that if I take a quaternion, right, and another quaternion, and I get out one. It's like this quaternion, if this quaternion is Q, then this one is Q inverse, right? Or one over Q, right? Because I get the, a one out. Like this. So moral of the story is each quaternion has an inverse. Okay, each quaternion has an inverse. That means I can divide, right? Because I can take one quaternion Q1, divide by the other one Q2, all I have to do is take Q1 times Q2 inverse. 
right? So here's a so these are kind of cool because I can multiply, I can add them, I can subtract them, I can multiply them, I can divide them. Okay, I can do everything you would normally want to do with numbers with these quaternions. Okay? Let's see, by the way, this thing here is typically called the length of the quaternion. And that's normally called the length of the quaternion. Square A, you square B, uh, uh, no, uh, let me take that off. The square root of A squared plus V squared is normally called the length of Q. Okay, that turns out to be the square of the length. So these things, these things are kind of cool. They have, you can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them, you can divide. They have a length, right? Everything about them is really cool. And this is why people love them so much, right? They're Probab no, it's supposed to be plus V in the second coordinate. You mean here? No, um, for your inverse uh, Right there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that should be a negative V, right? That should be a negative V. And again, there's a complete set of notes out there on the website for quaternions that has all of these, so if I make a minus sign error in here, please, uh, you know, look at those notes. Um, and, you know, so these things are kind of cool. They're just like numbers. Unfortunately, unfortunately, here, and this is how I multiply them together. What happens if I multiply Q2 times Q1? Okay. Like that. Okay, suppose I multiply them out. Well, these two are the same, right? These two are the same. Dot products commute very nicely. Uh, same things here, right? But when you look at dot products, V1 cross V2 is this way, right? V2 cross V1 is that way. Okay? It's exactly the opposite. And so here's something where you can, this is why they're a mathematical curiosity, because you can do everything with them <coughs> that you would like to be able to do. They have length, you can add them, you can subtract them, you can multiply them, you can divide them, okay? However, they don't have, they're the one thing that you can do everything with, but they don't have this commutative property. You have to watch out when you multiply because A times B is not equal to B times A, okay? And that's what's wrong with quaternions in the world. And this is what, you know, mathematicians love to look at things where um, they're really, uh, things that are numbers, right? look like numbers, act like numbers, do everything else, but one thing's wrong, right? And then what can we say about this? These are the questions that mathematicians would ask. Suppose we remove this one property from something, what can we say? Okay, how much can we say about these things? And uh, this is where so this is where quaternions pops up, is that it doesn't have this. It has everything you want, but it doesn't have this commutative property. Okay. Now, if I go back to that picture over there that we originally started with, when we had two rotations, did it one way and the other way, and they did not commute, right? This might clue you into something that you know we have in common here. And certainly we do because when we do rotations, what we have is something called the unit quaternions. Okay. Ah. Here's the unit quaternions. And the unit quaternions are simply quaternions, A and V, Okay, they look like quaternions where the length 
is 1. The length of the quaternion is 1. These are the unit quaternions, okay? And if you multiply two unit quaternions together, right, you can go over there and start multiplying if you like, but if you multiply two unit quaternions together, it's not too hard to see you get a unit quaternion back, okay? So these things are kind of closed in, under multiplication. If I multiply two unit quaternions together, I'm going to get a unit quaternion back, okay? And most unit quaternions look like this, okay? And they look like this, where the length, of, where, where they have in here a unit vector, right? And they have effectively a cosine sine relationship between them. Now, can you see really quickly that, that if I take the length of this guy, uh, I get something that looks like this, okay? If I take the length, it gets something that looks like this. If v is a unit vector, that's 1, right? And then you got square root of cosine squared plus sine squared, all right, which is also 1. Okay, so this is, this is a unit quaternion. And it turns out all of them can be written in this way. Okay, now you see where I'm going with this? Okay, you see where the rotations are going to come out? Because what this unit quaternion represents is a rotation of angle theta right, in the positive cupping direction of my fingers around the vector v, okay? A rotation in, uh, in the cupping direction of my fingers around the vector v, okay? And you'll have to think of the axis at, as being at the, at the origin here. But it gives us a rotation, right, around this vector v. Now, um, so, okay. Now, I have, you have to take me a little bit on faith on this one because otherwise I have to do about um, um, a three-hour <laughs> extra lecture in order to show you that this is actually rotation here, okay? But this is what unit quaternions do, is it gives me this, this out. And so what happens when I multiply two of these unit quaternions together, I get another unit quaternion, which will give me a rotation around a particular axis, okay, of a certain angle. I can figure out what theta is by just taking a cosine inverse of the first parameter, for example. And this enables us to pile up rotations really nicely, and actually you can prove you don't get gimbal lock. Right? There is no flipping over here. It enables us to pile up these rotations very, 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 very easily and figure out at the end, by multiplying them all together, right, one rotation around this axis that actually, one rotation around a particular axis, that actually gets us the same result as piling up all these other rotations together. So I can take 500 rotations, right, different rotations, multiply them all together and I can get one rotation out with an axis and an angle, and I get the same result when, it's, when I'm done. And these are the cool things about unit quaternions, okay? The other cool thing is that given any unit quaternion, there is a corresponding 4x4 four four matrix that you can write down that affects this same rotation, okay? And I never remember the matrix. It's out there in my code. I can't write it down. None of us ever remember it. We just copy it from, you know, whatever we've done before. It was, uh, it was shown in, the first one was shown in 1982, I think, right? And everybody else has just copied, and it works, so everybody else has just copied this code. But there is a 4x4 four four matrix given any unit quaternion. So I can do things with quaternions, okay, here, and I can multiply them all up together, right, and then get one quaternion out, which affects that rotation, and then get the 4x4 four four matrix that does it, okay? And so this is where we all use quaternions. Um, we use them to fly things around, you know, like a pilot, we, because you know, we can always guarantee kind of how our things work. And uh, we use quaternions a lot here. But we use them a lot and then, bango, at the end, we get back to 4x4 four four matrix, right? We pump that 4x4 four four, four matrix into model matrix, 
in OpenGL, let it apply to all our points, right? And it's as if we'd rotated all our points around. Okay? Now, the place where you normally use quaternions here, so if I confused everybody, I've gone a long ways, right? From Heisenberg 150 years ago to uh, 1982. Okay, I've gone a long way. But where most of us use quaternions, right off the bat, is in something called a trackball. Okay? And a trackball looks like this. Okay, we have some, some set of polygons that we want to view, okay, on the screen. And what we do is we think in 3D that there's a, we think of a sphere sitting around this, uh, this object, okay? We think of a sphere sitting around this object. And using QT or something else, what we do is we pick, we select, we click on a point here, hold the mouse button down, click on a point here, and we think of that point as being a point on our sphere. Okay? We think of that point as being a point on our sphere. And it's not too figure if you have this sphere in here, it's not too hard to figure out where on the sphere you actually you actually click. Okay? And then what we do is we pull we pull this point in one direction or another. Okay? We pull this point in one direction or another. And and it'll uh, QT will nicely just keep us giving getting these events back. And so um, what happens is, suppose I pull this point down here, okay? I, I want to make this, it actually turns out to be very small things, but I actually need to make it very big to show you what's happening. What I do is, is I think of the center of the sphere, think of the sphere in 3D here. I think of the center of the sphere and I get this vector, which was the original one, and that vector, right? And what I do is I take their cross product and I get an axis, okay? This will give me an axis through the origin if I take the cross product, okay? And then if I take the dot product, this gives me the, uh, the cosine of the angle, so I can get the angle that I've rotated here, okay? I can then take this theta and this vector here, which is V, okay? And I can make myself a unit quaternion, cosine theta, sine theta, V here. Okay, and I can take then the, the matrix that corresponds to this thing, okay, and pump this, this into model matrix and then draw my object over again and it will rotate, okay? And then, well, what do I do? Well, I'm going to drag this point again to another place, okay? And what I do is I then look at this vector from the center of the sphere out, this then is maybe phi, phi, six times, phi, okay. I get a, I take the cross product of these two, get another vector axis out. I can create another one, cosine phi, sine phi times, say, V1, if that's V1 here. And if I multiply these two together, I get a new quaternion, unit quaternion, right, of which I can find the axis and the angle in order to rotate my original figure as if I had rotated first here and then there, okay? And so what we do with this trackball is we click and pull, click and pull, click and pull, and we can rotate around our objects really fast. Okay? By doing this. And all we do is we just keep piling up the quatern unit quaternions as we go along. Okay? And it's a great way to rotate. You guys all have tons of sliders over here to change angles and everything else. We don't do that. We just click, pull, click, pull, click, pull, and things like that. The other thing people do with these, these things is that um, suppose I've clicked, pulled here, right? I can, there's a, uh, if some of you have noticed in QT there's a clock, um, there's a timer class, a Q timer class. And what it does is it'll give you a, what, we, what normally we call a tick, right? It'll give you a tick event every now and then. You can say, give me an event every uh, tenth of a second 
or something. Right? Throw this event every tenth of a second. And what, what happens is you can throw, you can, you can move this thing, let up on the mouse, and then every tenth of a second you can add that quaternion on again. Right? And what happens is your object starts animating in front of you. Right? If you use this tick. And so you can kind of throw these, it's almost as if you throw these things and they, they keep rotating in front of you. Okay? And it's something called a trackball. Everybody uses it with um, QT. Everybody uses it with QT and with uh, quaternions. And it's very, very elegant. It, it works very well. And it's something that you're going to be doing in the next assignment. Okay? You'll find it's much easier than varying all these sliders and parameters and everything that you have because you can rotate around things very nicely. So you can rotate. We have, we have uh, one button, maybe our left button rotates, our right button translates, um, our, our wheel zooms in and out. And we all have these things that we can do very quickly with our images that are all handled almost automatically by our system. Okay? And uh, one of the things I have when I, when I write QT code is I have something called a trackball class, okay? a uh, trackball canvas. Well, normally I have a canvas that I draw on, right, which, has, which is derived from QGL window. I have a canvas that I draw on. I then derive from that a trackball canvas, which implements my trackball. And I can, attach, I can you know, attach the trackball canvas whenever I want, and it just works. Right, so that I can code up anything I want, and I can move things around in 3D, okay, rotate them around in front of me. But we also use these quaternions in a lot of other places. We use it to fly our airplanes around and things like this. Um, and uh, it, they're very, very useful things to have. Okay. Now, um, I'm 15 minutes early. Is there any questions about this? I went a long ways today from like 1840 to today. Okay, but in general, with these quaternions, just you know, keep in your mind that you know quaternions themselves, it, they're an extension of the complex numbers, right? The best way to write them is a and v, where you have a and a vector, and then you can use dot product, cross product to define the multiplication. You can do everything with them. You can add, subtract, multiply, divide, except they don't commute, right? In multiplication, a times b is not b times a necessarily. Uh, there are cases where it does work, but very few. Okay, those are quaternions, and then the ones that are useful to us are the unit quaternions, because out of these we can pick out an angle theta, and we can pick out a, a unit vector, and uh, the unit vector becomes the axis we want to rotate around. The theta becomes the angle, and then we can get exactly a perfect translation to a four by four matrix, which then we can feed to OpenGL, right? And uh, and we're off um, doing things with these things. So it's one of the it's one of the things that uh, you know these are curiosities in the math department uh, because of the non commutation, um, but for us they're actually really useful, and we use them basically on a daily basis to handle things. Uh, now it's a little different here because now all these other things we've done are with these four by four matrices, and now we have this other thing called quaternions sitting in the middle to do things. But we always have to remember that we can get back to a four by four matrix if we want to from all these quaternions that we use. So people have now developed uh, uh, how to do curves on these quaternion spaces and things like this. And um, they've really uh, developed some very, very interesting things uh, as we move along. So um, as we go along in the next assignment, we're going to start doing We're going to start viewing things in different ways, right, using these things. And we're going to start going more toward um, um, uh, more interesting shapes and all that we pull out of GL. Okay, so all right, I'm done for today. Um, I will see you on Friday. <laughs>